Hello, welcome back to The Professor Speaks. I'm Raphael Chacon, Director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and also Professor of Art History and Criticism at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, the Western United States. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to our series on Roman art and culture. Specifically, we're looking at Roman art from the earliest days to the early Christian period. And today we follow a very interesting dynasty known as the Antonines. So if you'll bear with me a second, I'll share the screen and we will begin our PowerPoint presentation on the Antonines. So as you can see, this is an interesting dynasty. They have four, uh, four rulers, Antoninus Pius, his two sons, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, and then a third uh, emperor, Commodus. Uh, and these uh, were all descendants of the Antonine uh, family. And they were also placed there, interestingly enough, by Hadrian. Hadrian was one of the few emperors who was able to directly select his uh, successor. And in this case, he selected three. He had selected Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, and Lucius Verus. And all three emperors were, interestingly enough, quite successful in their time. So let's go ahead and uh, begin talking about the first one of these individuals, Antoninus Pius, born Titus Aurelius Fulvius Boionius Arius Antoninus Pius, but he's known as Antoninus Pius, his last two names. Born in 86 and died in 161 uh, in the Latium near Rome, born in the town of Lanuvium. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, if you remember Hadrian, both Hadrian and his predecessor Trajan were both Spaniards, Antoninus Pius is a descendant of a Gallic family, that is a French family. Uh, so we have another uh, potential foreigner on the, uh, on the, Roman, uh, on the Roman throne. Um, he married a woman by the name of Faustina Meyer, or Faustina the Elder, and we'll talk about her shortly. And in 138, he was adopted by Hadrian as his son. Antoninus, in turn, would adopt two young men, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius being the nephew of Faustina the Elder. And he ruled from 138 to 161. So this is a remarkably long period and actually a relatively peaceful period. The only squabbles that we know of were in fact uh, some uh, warfare on the Scottish border up in England and um, some invasions that came in from the north and that precipitated building of another wall. So if you remember, if you remember Hadrian built a wall across the British Isles and then there would be a second wall built by Antoninus Pius. I'll show you that shortly. Uh, Antoninus Pius was known for his piety and his relatively calm and steadfast rule. And here is in fact probably his greatest construction and that is the Antonine Wall that you see up there uh, right across from the Isle of Fir uh, Forth up on the northern part of the British Isles. Um, it's a smaller uh, wall, smaller and less impressive in terms of its construction than the wall of Hadrian that was built some 20 years earlier. Um, that wall, the Antonine Wall, is also in, uh, not as well kept um, as the Hadrian's Wall to the south. And here is a marvelous portrait at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City of Antoninus Pius as he was known. And he of course would continue that tradition of the bearded emperor that we saw in the, uh, in, in the portraits of Hadrian. Another marvelous portrait, this one in Munich at the Glyptothek, the, the sculpture collection there in the German, uh, in the Bavarian uh, city. Um, some more portraits of Antoninus Pius, um, the one on the left in London and the one on the right in Rome. But as you can see, a very consistent uh, portrait of this, um, this uh, successful ruler. And of course, his image and likeness also appears in many, many coins. For example, these two denarii show Antoninus Pius on the right in profile uh, and his wife Faustina the Elder on the left. And on that note, we should talk a little bit about Faustina because history hasn't been kind to her. Uh, we know that she was born sometime around the year 104 and died in the year 140. Uh, she was named in Augusta in, uh, in the year 138. So her name was actually Ania Galeria Faustina Augusta. Her reputation among Roman historians was that she was profligate. Uh, and of course, that's not, a very, um, that's not a very kind thing to say about her. And of course, we have to take those sorts of characterizations with a grain of salt. We do know that, um, that her husband, uh, Antoninus Pius, was quite loyal to her. And that when she died in the year 140, she was immediately deified. 
Um, and here are some portraits of her. Here's a portrait of her uh, from around the year 140. This one is in Madrid. And there is a major monument that in some ways is dedicated to her. Um, more than likely, this is part of a monument built by her sons uh, or the adopted sons of Antoninus Pius and Faustina the Elder. And this was built sometime around the year 161. As you can see, it's probably the base of some kind of monument, a statue or a column. And this is uh, to be found today in Rome. And what it shows us, interestingly enough, is this, uh, this heroic figure, this uh, winged figure, a Nike figure that is in fact bearing the emperor and his wife aloft to the heavens, uh, accompanied by two eagles, and then other gods framing the, the, the scene. But really what it is, it's an image of the deification or the apotheosis, the elevation, if you will, of these two important Antonine rulers. But there's an even more important monument in the Roman Forum itself. So let's go back to the Roman Forum and I wanna show you the temple that is here. Let's see if I can find my cursor. The temple that you see there in the center right of this image. And that is a temple that in fact was built by the sons in honor of the two parents, Antoninus Pius and Faustina the Elder. And I wanna show you a very interesting print. This is from Giovanni Battista Piranesi, the great um, a Baroque um, printmaker uh, and imagist of, of Rome. And what we see here is the Roman form as it looked like in the 18th century. Here is the temple that I'm about to show you. This is the temple to Antoninus um, Pius and Faustina or the temple of the Antonines. However, much of the temple in fact was underground. That is in fact, the level of the ground was much higher uh, after the collapse of the city of Rome. So all the, of all of this land that you see here is in fact infill, or rather the remnants filled in of the ancient Roman um, uh, forum. A few of the temples survived in, in fragments, including parts of the temple of Antoninus Pius and Faustina the Elder. And here you see that temple as it was reconstructed in the 17th century. And it's a very beautiful building today. The temple itself is the block that you see here in the back with its porch and columns. And then these, this, the staircase that you see in the front of it, in fact, has, was excavated in the late 19th and early 20th century. Notice that the doorway to the church of San Lorenzo, uh, built by Orazzo Torriani, uh, and this is, of course, a facade given it in the 17th century, was actually at this level up here. The entrance was up at this level, meaning that all of that you see here in the lower part of this photograph was in fact the, uh, the ruins of the ancient city. All of that had to be excavated away in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, revealing the base of the columns of the porch and revealing the actually the great staircase that led into the ancient temple. The new doorway, the doorway to the Church of San Lorenzo was actually much, much higher. A new floor was laid inside at the current ground level in the early 17th century. But the remarkable thing is that, of course, we can now see that it was a grand temple. It's, of course, it's missing its triangular pediment at the top and its original roof. And what you see up here is, in fact, the Baroque roof added in the 17th century by Orazio Torriani and, uh, and Roman builders at that point. Here, I want to take you back to this marvelous model by Italo Gismondi of the city of Rome in the fourth century. And we can see the Roman Forum here from the Colosseum leading us, or the, uh, the Flavian Amphitheater leading us all the way up to the Capitoline Hill here. And there you see the Temple of Antoninus um, and, and Faustina. That temple was opposite the small temple to the divine Julius. And again, here's a detail of that. The, the, here's the Capitoline Hill. And the Roman uh, and the different uh, imperial fora, built much later, of course. And here is the temple of Antoninus and Faustina, opposite the temple uh, of the deified Julius Caesar, on the via uh, on the via Sacra, leading all the way through the Roman Forum. So a very interesting location for them to build, um, and also a very interesting monument for them for the children to build in honor of their. Uh, now deified parents. And here we see that marvelous building with its Baroque infill uh, from the early 17th century. Now, I mentioned that Antoninus and Faustina had two sons. Um, the, the boys that you see here, and these are two wonderful portraits. The one on the left shows us Lucius Verus, 
at the age of seven, and Marcus Aurelius at, uh, 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 as a youth, probably around the age of 15, 16, 17 years on the right. And um, we know that at the time uh, of, of that they ascended to the throne, uh, Lucius Verus was 17 years old and the brother was seven. So roughly at this age, the two of them assumed the throne together. And here is a marvelous, uh, two marvelous portraits that show the two of them as adults. In this case, Marcus Aurelius is on the left and Lucius Verus on the right. And since Lucius had a much shorter reign uh, uh, and died um, earlier than Marcus Aurelius, let's go ahead and discuss him first. Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus uh, was born in the year 130. And again, he was the son of Lucius Aelius Caesar and he was the nephew of, uh, uh, of Anne, uh, Faustina the Elder. In 136, he was adopted by Hadrian and then by Ant Antoninus Pius in 138. He ruled from 161 to 169, so this was a very short reign. And, uh, and we know that he, uh, he actually uh, and, uh, took on some expeditions to Parthia in 162 and traveled also in Northern Italy and Pannonia between 167 and 168, but he died young, uh, presumably of natural causes in the year 169. And here are some marvelous portraits of him as a young man, uh, again, a heroic figure um, and wearing a beard, much like his, uh, his father uh, before him and his, uh, his uh, grandfather, his imperial grandfather, Hadrian, before him. Now, he was succeeded by his brother, Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aelius Aurelius Verus, who was born in the year 121. He was the son of Annius Verus, and he became consul in 140. Uh, he married Faustina the Younger in 145 and ruled between 161, along with his brother, for a few years until 169, and then continued to rule into uh, till 180. Um, apparently during his reign, there was some unrest in the provinces, which he had to quell. So between 162 and 166, he and his brother uh, went back to Parthia to uh, uh, calm insurrections there, and then Pannonia in 167 to 8. In the mid-70s, or in the early 70s, between 170 and 75, he was fighting the Germanic tribes of the Marcomanni up in uh, Germania. Uh, and continued to battle until the end of that decade. But really what Marcus Aurelius is known for is that he was in fact a philosopher. He was a member of a group of philosophers known as the Stoics, a very important philosophical camp in, um, in the intellectual landscape of the city of Rome. Uh, and he wrote a very, very important text which has survived today. And this text is known as the Meditations. And if you haven't read the Meditations, I highly recommend that you do because it is filled with all kinds of practical and moral instruction. Um, it's safe to say that Marcus Aurelius was not only a very prudent and wise man, but he was also very thoughtful. And, um, and the fact that he wrote these meditations and left them to us is really an amazing uh, a credit to his, not only his education, but the values, the inherent values of the society that he lived in. Romans could t uh, tend to be, they were both a violent people on the one hand, but they also were in a, an extremely learned, and it, depending on the class, of course, um, extremely learned and extremely philosophical. And so he continues this tradition that goes back to his grandfather, Hadrian, uh, of being interested in ancient philosophy and, uh, and cultivating it and writing his own. So the meditations are definitely worth your time uh, and we'll read a, a, a quote from the meditations a little bit later. Later, He wrote those meditations while he was up in the German lands, up along the Danube, uh, on the frontier of the, uh, of the Roman Empire in Northern Europe. Uh, he died in 180 in the city of Vindobona, which later would become Vienna, Austria. So a very important uh, location in later times. And here is a portrait of Marcus Aurelius as a young man. And again, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that, uh, that, um, that his philosophy is worth reading. And here's a quotation uh, that tells us a little bit about how he thought about um, the, his role, his new role as emperor. Quote, a man can live in a royal palace without wanting guards, embroidered clothing, torches, statues, or, any, or other such things. 
but rather to realize that it is within such a man's power to bring himself as close as possible to the conditions of an ordinary citizen. And that is in some ways the way that Marcus Aurelius lived his life. He lived much like an ordinary citizen, although he took his responsibilities as a ruler, as an emperor, quite seriously. Um, and, there, and here are some portraits of him as the philosopher king, philosopher emperor that he would become. So there we see an image of him on the left, also in the Munich Glyptothek, and uh, in the city uh, in Vienna, the Kunsthistorische Museum, the city where he eventually would die. There is a splendid monument dedicated to him in the Campus Martius, and this is this enormous column uh, dedicated to Marcus Aurelius. Um, and again, it has no rival, uh, except perhaps for the column of Trajan in the Roman Forum. But this is, of course, a smaller, less impressive uh, monument than the column in the Roman Forum to his great-great-grandfather, Trajan. Um, again, in this case, you have to ignore the Christian saint sitting atop this column. Presumably, there was once a statue of Marcus Aurelius atop this column. And not unlike the, the column of Trajan, it also recounts his events as a military man. So we see, in fact, some of his military campaigns depicted in this film strip-like uh, low relief carving, this bas relief that surrounds the column in the campus marshes. The quality, by the way, is incidentally, uh, I, I would say it's inferior to the, the quality of the carvings that you see in the column of Trajan. There are a few other ruined monuments uh, in and around Rome that date to the time of Marcus Aurelius. This is, for example, a, a relief that comes from a lost arch. We don't know what happened to this arch. It was destroyed probably in the fifth, if not the sixth centuries. Uh, and what it shows us is Marcus Aurelius standing here as a priest um, performing a sacrifice. So surrounded by members of the court and the animal that would be sacrificed on the altar. And in the distance, interestingly enough, there's a temple that looks uh, suspiciously like the temple that he and his brother dedicated to his parents, uh, Marcus, uh, uh, excuse me, Antoninus Pius and Faustina the Elder. Here's another statue of Marcus Aurelius. This one comes to us from Egypt, uh, showing him as a philosopher, which of course is what he was. But there is no greater portrait and no greater monument to Marcus Aurelius than the statue that you see today atop the Capitoline Hill in Rome. And this is a marvelous uh, statue. It shows the, the, uh, the emperor on horseback. So it's an equestrian statue in bronze of Marcus Aurelius as in fact a philosopher. Let me show you some more views of him. He's not shown as a military man, which is what you would normally expect an equestrian statue of the emperor to be um, uh, depicted as. He's rather shown as a philosopher in the robes of a philosopher with that uh, uh, outstretched arm sort of blessing the crowds um, below him. Uh, this is an, an incredible statue, but it's also located in a very, very special place. This is known as the Campidolio, and it is in fact an oval, uh, an oval square, if you will, that sits atop the Capitoline Hill today. Uh, it's remarkable for a number of reasons, not just because it has the statue of Marcus Aurelius on it, but also because the square was designed by the wonderful Renaissance artist Michelangelo Buonarroti. Michelangelo designed the square, gave new facades to some of the buildings that were there, and in fact created new buildings to flank this, created the, the pattern, the urban pattern for the square itself, and the plinth for the marvelous statue of Marcus Aurelius. Now, it's also interesting to note that the statue is uh, only survived uh, miraculously, uh, survived the pillaging and the destruction of ancient Rome, because the early Christian community believed that this was uh, the emperor Constantine. And you might know that Constantine was presumably the first Christian emperor. So in the Middle Ages, this sculpture was preserved, not because it was Marcus Aurelius or because Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher, but preserved because it was mistaken for the emperor Constantine. We now know that, of course, and in the Renaissance, they knew that this was indeed Marcus Aurelius, and it was re-erected by, um, by Michelangelo on that square when the square was refashioned in the 16th century. 
The statue that you see there today, by the way, and let me take you back, this statue is a facsimile, so it's not the original. Um, and of course, it's important to note that the original is indeed well preserved. It is preserved in the museum, uh, in the Capitoline Museum. There is in fact a quite a marvelous hall uh, where the original sculpture is, um, is displayed and you can visit that today when you visit Rome. Uh, and you can see that the statue was made of bronze and it was gilded. So originally it was in fact uh, quite striking um, when it reflected that sunlight on the gilded surface. We don't know exactly where the statue was placed. It could have been on a temple, it could have been uh, in a public uh, plaza somewhere in the ancient capital. And today it sits atop the Capitoline Hill, uh, facing opposite the Roman Forum, uh, incidentally. And here are some more views of that statue as it looks today. It's been uh, lovingly restored uh, and its surface is indeed the original surface with much of its gilding loss, but enough of it uh, surviving uh, to let you know what the original must have looked like in its uh, original splendor. Um, let me show you an image of his wife, uh, of Marcus Aurelius' wife, and this is Faustina the Younger. And here's a lovely portrait of her as a young woman, this one in Paris. And Faustina, uh, not unlike uh, Faustina the Elder, uh, suffered from this, uh, this charge of profligacy. Uh, we don't know to what extent this is true or not, but we do know that she had 13 children with uh, her cousin Marcus Aurelius. And one of those children, Commodus, would then become the next emperor. Here are two other images of Faustina the Younger. Uh, on the right, a, uh, a silver denarius with her in profile, and on the left, a marvelous portrait of the elder Faustina, uh, also located in the loop. So, as I mentioned, Marcus Aurelius and Faustina the, the Younger had a son, uh, and this would be the next uh, emperor, the last of the Antonine emperors. Um, he was born in 161 in Lanuvium uh, and groomed for the throne uh, from his infancy. He ruled uh, 12 years from one, the year 180 to the year 192. And one could argue that his, his um, reign was in fact the end of a good run. Um, the Historia Augustae, which was written much, much later after Augustus, describes him as base, cruel, lewd, dishonest, defiled, and debauched. Uh, it tells us that he ruled as a tyrant uh, and that he actually earned a disgraceful peace with the Marcomanni and the Cavadi, or Germanic tribes. Um, so again, Take these accounts with a grain of salt. And if you want to put him in the camp of the good emperors versus the bad emperors, Commodus is in the camp of the bad emperors. Um, what were his interests? Well, we know that he was an athlete and that he was interested in the gladiatorial combat. So during his 12 year reign, there were many, many sports events in the capital city. Um, he considered himself a living God. In fact, he called himself Hercules incarnate, that is Hercules in the flesh. He insisted on being called Hercules Romanus, or the Roman Hercules. Remember, Hercules Heracles was an ancient Greek deity who was part divine, part mortal, who, uh, who uh, had to accomplish 12 great feats in order for his divinity, to, in order to, to, uh, to fulfill his role as a divine being. Well, uh, Commodus styled himself as a modern day Hercules. That may seem kind of ridiculous to us today, and yet he was in, in, indeed quite popular as this uh, athlete emperor. Um, we also know that he renamed Rome, the capital city, Colonia Commodiana, the Commodian colony. Um, and of course, that's a name that did not stick. Uh, in 192, in the year 192, Commodus was assassinated by another athlete. He was strangled, um, and the Senate damned him. So, he, uh, so they, they issued a damnatio memoriae, uh, that is to erase his name from the annals of the Roman emperors. However, that damnatio was reversed by his successor, Septimius Severus. And let's take a look at some of the portraits of Commodus. There are some interesting images of him as a young man, 
Uh, the one on the left is in the Römisch Germanisches Museum in Cologne, in Cologne, uh, Germany, and the one on the right in Paris. And what, uh, what is interesting about his portrait is that he has these kind of rather droopy or sleepy eyes, and that's one way of easily uh, telling him apart from the other Antonine emperors. Um, because eventually he will sport a beard and will have the curly locks of his predecessors as well. Uh, here's another portrait, this one in the Capitoline in Rome, and this one in the Vatican. This is a full-length portrait, and you see this in the 19th century photograph, this dual image of him uh, as a warrior uh, from the 19th century. Uh, he appears in, uh, in coins as well, and the one on the right is rather interesting. This is, of course, a drawing of a, of a coin, a denarius, uh, that shows him wearing the lion's uh, head, the Nemean lion's head, which uh, uh, was one of the attributes of Hercules. So if you see a Roman emperor with the attributes of Hercules, more than likely it is Commodus uh, as the Roman Hercules. And the most spectacular image of him is indeed on the Capitoline Hill in the Palazzo dei Conservatori, one of the palaces, one of the three palaces on the Capitoline Hill today. Uh, there is this marvelous, marvelous portrait of Commodus as Hercules, um, holding the club of Hercules on the one hand, uh, the apples of the Hesperides on the other, and then wearing that fabulous headdress, which is in fact the head of the Nemean lion. Uh, there are other elements down below, cornucopias, other figures down below, um, that are also seen to be uh, the, the attributes of Commodus as an emperor. And on that note, we will end the Antonine dynasty, and we'll pick it up with the next dynasty, the dynasty of the Severans. Thank you very much for your attention. Don't forget to like us on YouTube, and take good care.